Good evening. Welcome. We're going to let a final few guests filter in virtually and we'll start in just a second. Well, good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome to this evening's webinar, Challenging Environmental Racism from the Local to the Global. And it's sponsored by the Schiller Institute for Integrated Science and Society and the Boston College Forum for Racial Justice in America. My name is Vincent Rougeau. I'm the Dean of the Law School here at Boston College, and I'm also the inaugural director of the Boston College Forum on Racial Justice in America, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you here tonight. At Boston College, we've decided to address the reality of structural racism through a new project called the Forum on Racial Justice in America. And this evening's program is capping an ongoing series of events since the beginning of October that have launched the Forum at BC through the university's academic and spiritual life, student affairs programming, and the professional activities of faculty and staff. And as the inaugural director of the forum and someone who's spent many years thinking in scholarly terms about the relationship between American law and Catholic social teaching, I see the forum's work as being rooted in a profound understanding that personal conversion alone is insufficient to end racism in this country. Boston College must commit as an institution to dismantling racist structures. It must challenge the members of the BC community to live out the beliefs core to our mission that all human beings are of equal dignity. We have to recognize that racism is everyone's problem. Become actively conscious about race and racism, take actions to end racism in our daily lives, and to understand that we all have a role in stopping it. But we often encounter resistance. And as Van Newkirk II noted in a piece on environmental racism in the Atlantic Magazine in 2018, the idea of environmental racism is, like all mentions of racism in America, controversial. Even in the age of climate change, many people still view the environment mostly as a set of forces of nature, one that cannot favor or disfavor one group or another. And even those who recognize that the human sphere of influence shapes almost every molecule of the places in which humans live, from the climate to the weather to the air that they breathe, they're often loath to concede that racism is a factor. To many people, racism often connotes purposeful decisions by a master hand, and many see existing segregation as a self-sorting or poverty problem. Couldn't the presence of landfills and factories in disproportionately black neighborhoods have more to do with the fact that black people tend to be disproportionately poor and thus live in less desirable neighborhoods? Well, our panel today will help to undermine that increasingly unsupportable line of thinking. Study after study has shown that regulations and business decisions are strongly influenced by whether or not people of color are around. So let's now hear from those experts. And to introduce our panel today and to be our moderator, I'd like to introduce Laura Steinberg. Laura J. Steinberg is the Seidner Executive Director of the Schiller Institute for Integrated Science and Society and Professor of Earth and Environmental Sciences. Professor Steinberg joined Boston College in May of this year after many years at Syracuse University where she held three leadership roles, serving as interim director of the Syracuse Center of Excellence for Environmental and Energy Systems, the founding director of Syracuse's Infrastructure Institute, and special assistant for strategy to the vice chancellor for innovation and strategic initiatives. She's also the former dean of Syracuse University's College of Engineering and Computer Science, and was professor in the Department of Civil and, en and Environmental Engineering. An internationally respected civil and environmental engineering scholar whose research has focused on infrastructure and sustainability, environmental modeling and technological innovation. Professor Steinberg holds a bachelor's degree in civil and urban engineering from the University of Pennsylvania and a master's degree and PhD in environmental engineering from Duke University. She's also studied in the MBA program at the Graduate School of Business at the University of Chicago. So it's my great pleasure to welcome my colleague, Professor Laura J. Steinberg. Thank you so much for the introduction, Vince, and greetings to all. 
on this on this webinar. It is a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to welcome you to the webinar. I'm also very happy to introduce this first event from the Schiller Institute for Integrated Science and Society at Boston College. The Schiller Institute is dedicated to fostering a just, bountiful, and enduring world, and one that is responsive to the needs of people and communities across the globe. In the research and teaching that we sponsor through the Institute, we take inspiration from the Jesuit tradition of the common good, a tradition that encourages the creation of space for dialogue, bringing different perspectives to bear in the search for truth, and a tradition of taking action individually and collectively to create a peaceful and just society. The Institute aims to be informed by the best ideas about science and from science and from creative thinkers and doers everywhere. We have a special emphasis at the Schiller Institute on issues at the intersections of society and environment, energy, and health. These are areas where we see both great challenge and great opportunity for our contributions. So in this sense, it would be hard to find a more appropriate topic for the Schiller Institute to ad address than environmental racism. As our speakers will explain, environmental racism reaches deep into the lifeblood of communities, causing an accumulation of environmental harms, threatening health, and eroding the value and cohesion of neighborhoods. This is a fundamental issue for society, which communities of color have grappled with, largely unaided, for a very long time. The Black Lives Matter movement, climate justice activism, disproportionate impacts of COVID-19, and the dying words of George Floyd as he lied on the pavement in Minneapolis gasping, I can't breathe, have helped to rocket issues of environmental racism to new levels of public awareness. However, motivated as we may be now, it's true that understanding and taking effective action on environmental racism will require linkages with science and social context, ethics and policy. The Schiller Institute is undertaking a concerted interdisciplinary effort to explore the origins, extent and effects of environmental racism and to work towards approaches to combating this deadly injustice. We seek to understand environmental racism as a manifestation of structural racism and to struggle with its implications for making meaningful change. The Schiller Institute will be sponsoring a series of events over the next year on this topic, so please stay tuned for notifications about these. So we are hoping that this programming will equip you with insights and capabilities that will allow you to engage in whatever ways you're most comfortable with addressing the challenges of environmental racism, locally, nationally, or globally. In the creation and planning of this event, I am indebted to the Environmental Racism Planning Committee. This is a group of 20 faculty, students, and staff from BC who have worked tirelessly over the last two months to put this program together. They represent such programs as the African and African Diaspora Studies Program, the Rappaport Center for Law and Public Policy, the Environmental Studies Program, the Office of Student Involvement, the School of Public of Social Work, the Departments of Sociology and History, the Complex Problems and Enduring Questions Core Curriculum, the Black Student Forum, and others. Now to our program. Our guest speakers are Dr. David Pello, Professor of Environmental Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and Reverend Mariama White Hammond, the founding pastor of New, of New Roots AME Church in Dorchester, Massachusetts. Um, I will introduce um, both panelists now, and um, they will then uh, speak uh, in, in sequence. So um, Professor David N. Pello is the Dielson Chair and Professor of Environmental Studies and Director of the Global Environmental Justice Project at the University of California, Santa Barbara, where he teaches courses on social change movements, environmental justice, 
human-animal conflicts, sustainability, and social inequality. Professor Pello has published numerous works on environmental justice issues in communities of color in the US and globally. His two most recent books are What is Critical Environmental Justice, Polity Press 2017, and Total Liberation, The Power and Promise of Animal Rights and the Radical Earth Movement, University of Minnesota Press 2014. In addition to his scholarly contributions, Professor Pello has consulted for and served on the boards of directors of community-based national and international organizations, including the Community Environmental Council, Global Action Research Center, the Center for Urban Transformation, Global Response, Greenpeace USA, International Rivers, and the Prison Ecology Project. Professor Pello earned his BA in sociology and religious studies at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and his MA and PhD in sociology from Northwestern University. The title of Professor Pello's talk is Confronting Environmental Racism and Lifting Up Environmental Justice. Reverend Mary Emma White Hammond is the founding pastor of the New Roots AMA Church in Dorchester, Massachusetts. Reverend White Hammond is an advocate for ecological and social justice, youth engagement, and spirit filled organizing. Reverend White Hammond uses an intersectional lens, challenging people to see the connections between such issues as immigration and climate change and between energy, policy, and economic justice. Reverend White Hammond speaks throughout the country. She's a fellow with the Green Justice Coalition and she served as the MC for the 2017 Boston Women's March and Boston People's Climate Mobilization. She serves, R Reverend White Hammond serves as the co-chair of Renew New England, a regional coalition advocating for green New Deal policies. As a former director of Project Hip Hop, she used the arts as a tool to raise awareness for social issues. Reverend Mariama has received numerous awards, including the Bar Fellowship, the Celtics Heroes Among Us, the Roxbury Founders Day Award, and the Boston NWACP Image Award. Reverend White Hammond will be speaking on ecological justice, local context, and opportunity for justice. All right, I will now turn the program over to Dr. Pello. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that, that kind introduction, Dr. Steinberg, and it is uh, wonderful to be here with you all this afternoon. I bring you greetings from occupied and unceded indigenous Chumash lands, also known as Santa Barbara, California. So I'd like to begin today uh, by telling you a story about how I got my start in this work. Some years ago, I was hired by this person, Hazel Johnson, founder and executive director of PCR, People for Community Recovery, an environmental justice group on the largely African-American Southeast side of Chicago. PCR was based in All Gill Gardens, a public housing project, 10,000 people, nearly 100% low income and African-American. This was one of the earliest examples of a community-based environmental justice organization that enjoyed a national profile, a national presence. I was hired to do research, do grant writing and other tasks for this organization, and I worked for them for many years. But sometime before that, long before that moment, they became well known for their inspiring and impactful activism. For example, on one early morning, going way back to 1987, Hazel Johnson and members of her staff, all African Americans, along with their white allies from a large environmental organization, engaged in an act of civil disobedience against an incinerator company located in that community. They coordinated what we call a lockdown, wherein they chained themselves to vehicles that were placed in the path of trucks that were bringing hazardous waste into their community to be burned in their community in the incinerator. The activists held their ground for many hours in defiance of this company. And this was one of just dozens, one of dozens of polluting operations in this largely African-American community. And by the end of the day, 
the coalition had turned away no less than some 57 hazardous waste trucks. That was an impressive accomplishment, but also quite a disturbing indicator of just how much waste was being burned in this community. Hazel Johnson was always pleased and proud of this action, and of course, more proud of the fact that that action led to the shutdown of that hazardous waste chemical facility. This was a remarkable act of resistance from within a small, low-income community of color. But this case is important to me not only because it reflected the power of local community-based activism against environmental racism, that is, the heavy burden of toxins and pollutants imposed on communities of color, but also because it involved a multiracial collaboration between grassroots non-governmental organizations, and because every actor, every stakeholder in this particular drama, in this seemingly local drama, had very strong transnational and global ties. Prior to and following this action, for example, Hazel Johnson and members of her staff were traveling to Nigeria, to South Africa, to Brazil, and to many indigenous nations, building common cause. The collaborating environmental organization in this action was Greenpeace, an organization I have worked for, uh, as Dr. Steinberg pointed out, an, an organization with offices, personnel, and campaigns in multiple countries, dozens of nations across the planet. The target of this action the corporate target was Chem Waste Management, a hazardous waste subsidiary of Waste Management Incorporated, one of the largest waste management corporations on planet Earth with revenues in the billions of dollars and with operations in multiple nations across several continents. So in this light, what at first appeared to be primarily a conflict, a local conflict between some activists and a company in some community on the south side of Chicago, was also actually reflective of how many environmental justice struggles are simultaneously local and global. And this case goes back to 1987 and foreshadowed the growing globalization of the movement against environmental racism. This case is also important from a gender justice and a feminist perspective because Hazel Johnson, may she rest in peace, was a leader who was also a mother and a grandmother who used those identities to demonstrate that she was not only protecting herself, but she was defending her family, her children, and her children's children, and her entire community to mobilize people in favor of environmental justice. She later became known as the Black Mother of the Environmental Movement, a moniker that has been well earned. Today I live in California, on the central coast of California, just north of LA where I've been involved in a number of environmental and climate justice struggles. For example, for generations, electricity in my region on the central coast of California has been generated uh, by polluting gas-fired power plants across the coast, primarily located in this town, Oxnard, California, a working class community that is 85% people of color, 75% Latinx. Oxnard already has three power plants, smokestacks, dotting its shoreline, the most of any city on the coast of California. And yet, and yet, until recently, um, very recently, they had a proposal for yet another power plant, a fourth power plant, that would again produce more greenhouse gases and impose more particulate matter in the lungs and the bodies of the people living in this beautiful town. Here's the rub, though. And this is the essence of environmental and climate injustice. Oxnard would be producing the electricity, but they wouldn't be getting any of it. It would be going to communities like mine in Santa Barbara, much wealthier communities, while Oxnard would be shouldering the burden of all of that particulate matter, all of that pollution. That's the essence of environmental and climate justice. They're contributing the least to the problem and yet getting the brunt of the problem. And this was a community where many neighborhoods are in the 90th percentile of asthma sufferers in the state of California. And that's enormous, given how much asthma is an issue in this state. But the people were not going to take this passively. They weren't going to take this lying down. So grassroots organizations, um, NGOs, college youth, youth from high schools, people all around this community rose up against this power plant and said no 
to this polluting fossil fuel facility and said yes to positive and constructive policies like regenerative development, like clean and good paying and safe jobs, like the largest wetlands restoration project in Southern California over here at Ormond Beach. And so at the end of the day, they won. They won. Not one brick was laid on this power plant. And so this, like the case of, his, of Hazel Johnson and People for Community Recovery, was an enormously important victory for climate justice and environmental justice. And I'm proud to be a part of this movement. I also want to give a shout out to CAUSE, the Central Coast Alliance United for a Sustainable Economy, which was the lead organization in this campaign. So what I want to do now is to discuss a few key guiding questions that really structure my work, whether it's the scholarly work or the activist work. And the first is very basic. How are social inequality and environmental quality linked? I think we've begun to answer that in this conversation already. What roles do social movements play in shaping environmental policy? And third and finally, how can we simultaneously improve people's quality of life and promote ecological sustainability? For me, these questions are the essence of what the environmental justice movement is all about. It is an intersectional, multi-issue, multi-sectoral, multilingual, multi-racial, multi-ethnic, and multinational movement. And as you can see, I'm quite excited about it. Always have been. Let me clear up and make sure we're, we're on the same page uh, with respect to some key terms here. So let's talk about environmental inequality, environmental injustice. This is the term I use to describe a situation when any marginal population, any vulnerable population, suffers a disproportionately high burden of environmental harm. And it's usually because they've been excluded from the environmental decision-making uh, process that affects their community. This affects indigenous communities, communities of color, immigrant communities, working class communities of all stripes, on and on and on. So that's environmental inequality, environmental injustice, for me an overarching term. A subset of environmental injustice is the problem of environmental racism. This is when environmental injustice involves communities of color. It is that unequal protection against a range of environmental, toxic, polluting, climate threats that communities of color face. And of course, again, it is often the result of these communities being systematically excluded from the decision-making processes that lead to the planning, to the zoning in their communities. Empirical evidence, as has already been stated in this forum, empirical evidence uh, of these inequalities of environmental racism is supported by literally thousands of studies going back at least to the early 1970s. So the bottom line is that low wealth, low income communities, communities of color face disproportionate environmental risk and exposure. And we've got to acknowledge that and do something about that. So let me take a moment to then acknowledge, define, and unpack that key word within the phrase environmental racism. Racism. Racism, as has been said already, is something that is not limited to the acts of individual bigots, right? It is something more importantly that is perpetrated on a massive scale by institutions, by organizations, by corporations, by states, by governments every day. In other words, racism is far more than merely the prejudice and discrimination of an individual engaged in interpersonal animus. Ultimately, According to cultural geographer Ruth Wilson Gilmore, racism is really important to take seriously because it can lead to, quote, group differentiated vulnerability to premature death, end quote. In other words, this is where the rubber hits the road. Air pollution, water pollution, all these forms of environmental injustice really hit the, hit the rubber hits the road because people are, are experiencing excess morbidity and mortality. They're dying. They're getting sick. Right? And we see this isn't abstract at all when we think about the intersection of health and racism, because today, December 1, 2020, literally hundreds of thousands of people have been dying in the United States, disproportionate among them, people of color, indigenous folks, immigrants. So we have to deal with this. So those are the things I don't want any more of. Those are the things we are opposed to, we are confronting. Let me be more positive and talk about what I am embracing, and that is environmental justice. What is environmental justice? Well, we can start with the United States Environmental Protection Agency's definition, which is the meaningful 
involvement and fair treatment of all people, regardless of income, race, color, national origin, origin, with respect to the development, the implementation, and the enforcement of environmental rules, laws, regulations, etc. That's important, but it's a good start and only a good start. The environmental justice movement goes bolder, goes deeper and broader. For us, environmental justice has to be a, a goal and a vision that isn't just about enforcing the law evenly. It's a goal and a vision where no community is unfairly burdened with pollution or other environmental harms and where social justice and ecological sustainability prevail. That's what environmental justice is for me. And this must involve the support and participation of movements. And so let's talk about movements that cross these, the spectrum of ethnic and racial groups. The environmental justice movement includes first and foremost indigenous communities who face a range of threats from toxins, pollution, climate change, etc. This top photo, of course, comes to us from the thousands of people who came together recently in the state of what we now call North Dakota to peacefully oppose the construction of the D Dakota Access Pipeline, an underground oil pipeline that threatens sacred sites drinking water, and the lands of indigenous people, who recently, just this June, had a major victory grinding that development to a halt. Underneath that is a picture of folks at UC Berkeley, you know, students there, protesting the 30-meter telescope, a massively large telescope that has become controversial due to its planned location on Mauna Kea, which is on the island of Hawaii and the most sacred mountain in indigenous native Hawaiian culture. The University of California, my employer, my work site, uh, is the institution that is trying to build this telescope and a major grassroots movement has emerged to put a stop to this effort. Now, both of these campaigns reveal that for many indigenous communities, uh, the health of people is directly related to the health of the land and the water, the local water, and that sacred sites, sacred spaces, play a major role in their environmental justice struggles frequently. So that's Native America. Let's move on to Asian Pacific Islander America, APEN, an amazing group. The Asian Pacific Environmental Network has promoted environmental justice for many years in communities on the West Coast, in residential neighborhoods fighting pollution, in schools where students are facing a range of toxic threats, and among youth who are leading this movement to improve the health and well being of both immigrant and native born Asian Pacific American communities. So, a really important movement and organization to learn more about. Let's talk about African and African American communities with, with respect to climate change in particular. African societies are much less responsible for climate disruption than wealthier societies around the world, due primarily to lower per capita energy consumption and lower per capita greenhouse gas generation. And yet, according to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, Sub-Saharan Africa is the region on planet Earth most likely to bear the brunt of climate change. And this is the essence of climate injustice. You're contributing the least to the problem, and yet you're bearing the brunt. The Pan-African Climate Justice Alliance, thankfully, is a really important part of the effort to push for climate justice on the continent and globally. So is the commitment of students like these pictured in the lower left here um, in South Africa who have participated in climate strikes, taking a day off from school to demand substantive policy changes from elected officials. And of course, you're familiar with climate strikes probably because Greta Thunberg has uh, made a big splash of doing exactly that. We've got on the right hand, uh, Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison, uh, a good colleague of mine and the president of the board of the Sierra Club, Aaron Mayer, fighting for climate justice. African Americans, like Africans, are also less responsible for generating carbon and greenhouse gas emissions, but also bear a disproportionate burden of the associated costs. For example, African Americans live in greater proximity to coal-fired power plants. They face greater vulnerability to asthma, heat waves, so-called natural disasters, food insecurity, and tend to pay higher prices for energy. This, again, is the essence of climate injustice. And so one conclusion that we can draw from this is that the movement for climate justice must be global, and it has to be linked 
to the broader movement to end the legacies of colonialism and racism. Another important movement that is completely entangled with the environmental and climate justice movements, of course, is the food justice movement. Important work by scholars and activists have found that working class, poor, low income, indigenous communities, immigrant communities tend to be sites of hunger more often than not, malnutrition and poor health as a result, at least partially as a result of the dominance and control over our food systems by an exceedingly small group of corporations who are focused primarily on profiteering rather than on feeding people. Moreover, many of those same corporations, of course, are producing food using large quantities of toxic herbicides, pesticides, and petroleum-derived products, which imperil us as consumers, as fence-line and frontline communities, our ecosystems, and our climate. So the food justice movement seeks to democratize control over our food systems so that they are much more socially equitable and ecologically sustainable. So what I want to do now is to give you a little bit of a sense of some of the global scale of some of the work I've been doing. Um, this book was the result of a collaboration among more than a dozen activists and scholars around the world from Latin America, Eastern Europe, uh, Asia, North America, uh, and beyond to document the problems of environmental injustice related to the IT or the electronics industry and to support the movement for environmental justice in those communities. And we've done, a, I'd say, a pretty darn good job of that changing policies of companies around the world, changing laws in nations and states around the world to improve the health of workers and residents near um, these, these electronics industries. Several years ago, I and several other colleagues, primarily based in the nation of Ecuador, produced this guide, a guide for community organizers who are fighting against mining companies and other extractive industries. We've translated into six languages, and it has been used in movements all around the world. Today, I'm working with an enormously fabulous group of activists and students drawing and documenting links between the prison system and the jail system in the United States and around the globe and environmental justice concerns. And we are finding that water contamination, air contamination, toxic waste, all of these things don't just affect communities of color outside of prisons, but they affect us inside of prisons. And one of the most inspiring things is some of the most exciting leaders in the movement for environmental justice are people who are behind bars, are caged human beings who are leading this movement in new and generative directions. And this, of course, brings me to Black Lives Matter. Sorry, let me adjust that there. I was just stated Black Lives Matter is an important political and social formation because it's drawing connections between racist state violence and long histories of, of movements for social justice. The, the phrase, I can't breathe, which too many of my brothers and sisters have been uttering uh, in their last moments uh, at the hands of, of police as, as they are dying, um, is a double move in this movement. It is a move to demonstrate that police violence is literally choking the life out of us, but we are also finding that that is connected to the fact of environmental racism, where governments and companies are also injecting and imposing pollution and particulate matter on our lungs, on our bodies, of us and our families and our communities, making it difficult, if not impossible, to breathe. So environmental justice and Black Lives Matter movements are closely aligned. In the last minute or so, I'd just like to point out that the Green New Deal is something that is not just a, a resolution or a template at the federal level, but as you may know, it is proliferating around the United States in cities, counties, and states, including in my region. And we are proposing a framework for a Green New Deal here that isn't just about green jobs. It's not just about a fair transition for fossil fuel workers who would be taken care of and respected and given dignity as we move from that death-dealing fossil fuel economy to a life-giving, regenerative economy, but we're also integrating our work around Green New Deal with the movement for Black lives, with movements for indigenous sovereignty, saying no uh, to oil, keeping oil in the ground, but saying yes to solar power, saying no to unbridled inequality, but saying yes to affordable housing. So I'm really excited about this. And the last thing I will say, and this is very important to me, is that justice, equity, and diversity is not, these things are not just a box to be checked. Because inequality is arguably the single most important driving factor 
producing social and environmental inequalities. More broadly, inequality and in particular racism is perhaps the most important driving factor behind our global environmental crisis. Naomi Klein, the great Canadian journalist, told me once that the first financial supports that made possible capitalism, the system that brought us anthropogenic climate change, the money that made that system possible first came from systems of racial brutality and unbridled violence, of colonialism, of chattel enslavement, conquest and enslavement and genocide. So this is a part of our DNA. It is at the root of what this country has been about and we have to treat it as such. So racial inequalities are the foundations of our environmental challenges. And so we need to remember that in these conversations. So thank you so much, it's a pleasure to be here. And now I'll turn it over to my good colleague, the Reverend Mariama White Hammond. I'm just gonna jump in here for a minute. Um, thank you so much, Professor Pello. I wanted to remind our listeners that uh, there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to use it to enter questions. At the end of Reverend Mariama's talk, we'll then have a moderated conversation that I will moderate for about 20 minutes. Following that, We'll have 30 minutes or so of questions and answers with our panelists. And I'll take those questions from those that appear on the chat box. And with that, uh, Reverend Miriamma White Hammond is, um, I think, ready to talk. Thank you, Laura. Um, it's really good to be here. Um, really thank. Um, Dr. Powell for that uh, introduction and, and really the framing around the conversation that we are engaged in today. Um, my goal tonight is to, uh, is to share um, both a framing that I completely agree with. I do work on environmental um, racism and want to uh, expand sort of the, the way I frame my work and then to talk a lot about um, the local context, uh, because um, I am right here and in Dorchester um, and very close to BC. And um, there's a lot going on right here, both um, exciting and some challenges and, and areas for us to keep pushing. So again, as I, I, I mentioned, my, my name is Reverend Mariama White Hammond. Um, I am a pastor and, you know, I have a bunch of different roles, um, but I, um, live here in Dorchester um, in the stolen land of the Massachusetts people, um, pretty close um, to the ocean. I'm about uh, three quarters of a mile um, from Carson Beach. Um, uh, it's, not, it's not a California beach, I'll, I'll, I'll admit, uh, much more modest than that, but uh, we are right here. And, and I think, um, as Professor Powell mentioned, though, there, it is no accident that the most vulnerable communities are always asked to take on the greatest environmental danger, always. Um, and it's not just from an, uh, an environmental perspective that unfortunately is the case in so many um, different arenas in our society. And so the, the frame that I use for the work that I do um, is ecological justice. And this is not a critique of, I also do environmental justice, I also do climate justice, so it's not a uh, either or but it is the way that I define my work. And I, and I use that because ecology um, is uh, really the study of, the learning of, the understanding of home. And eco in Greek means home. So e ecology is the study of the learning of home. And it's about um, a posture that we take to the planet and all of um, the beings that are part of that planet um, that comes not from a place of us being in charge, but a, of us being one member of a larger system. And from my perspective, that system, that ecosystem that we live in is um, in a crisis of relationship. And so ecological justice is the work of repairing the dysfunction in our relationships with the rest of um, the beings in this planet. Um, from my perspective, we only have one home. I know that, you know, um, yeah, Elon Musk is trying to figure out how to get us to Mars, but from, for right now, we have one home. And um, we do not act well 
in this home, we do not behave in the way um, that we should. And so I see climate as a deadline. Climate itself is not the problem. Our dysfunctional relationships are the problem. But climate is the deadline that we have to get ourselves together. If we don't shift, if we don't evolve, if we don't change, we will be evicted from this home. People often say, oh, we're fighting to save the planet. I just wanna make it clear, she's gonna be okay. Mother Earth will continue to survive. She may look different. She may have lost some of her uh, members, but she will continue to evolve. Um, and she will continue to survive. Now the question is whether or not she will continue to be a hospitable home for us. Because we are the one species that doesn't quite seem to be able to get with the program. I liken it to, um, uh, the earth is a really big dorm building and we are all uh, residents of the dorm. But there's one resident in this dorm that really doesn't know how to act. They turn their music up loud at all hours of the night. They go to the bathroom and don't flush. Um, they don't take good aim in the urinals. They um, leave their clothes out in the hallways. Um, they don't take their trash out. They just really don't know how to act. And it's come to the point where it's so bad that other residents have wanted to be transferred, have basically left the university and moved somewhere else because of this one resident that doesn't know how to behave. That resident is us, the human species. We really don't know how to behave. And so the question for us is how long will Mother Earth allow us to stay given our poor behavior? And so that for me is about a whole series of things in terms of how we treat people who we call immigrants, how we make decisions about where there is the there were official lines of quote unquote border are, and how we treat people depending on which side of the line they were born on. It comes out in how we allow police officers um, to treat some folks and not others. Um, I've been working actively on police reform in the state and Today we are, I'm waiting for the text message to tell me that they um, voted on it at the state house. Um, and so there are many dysfunctions in the way that we as a species behave to one another and the way that we behave to other members of this earth community. For me, climate change is not about dealing with parts per million in the atmosphere. It is about human beings evolving to become something different and something better. And for me, from a theological perspective, that means being who God has called us to be since the beginning of time in many different traditions. I mean, I don't know how many ways God has to tell us um, to live in right relationship with our nature, with nature and living in right relationship with each other. I don't know how many other ways we have to hear it. And unfortunately, as is often the case, sometimes we only become our best selves when a crisis requires us to act. And so we are in a moment where the crisis has reached a level where we are required to act um, and, and in many different ways. So I wanna talk about uh, three different things I see happening locally um, that respond to that question of how do we evolve and how do we shift and how do we do that right here in Massachusetts? Um, I think we imagine ourselves as a super liberal state where everything must be on point. And I'm sorry to let you know, guys, that that unfortunately is not true. Um, the reality is um, that we in Massachusetts can talk a really good game about uh, racial equity and environmental justice, and that does not always hold up in our practice. One example of that is that right now we are in the middle of fighting and we'll see if we can get it passed before December 31st since I just finished police reform now. I'm gonna put all my energy in this. Um, we have an environmental justice bill at the state house that's just basically looking to define what environmental justice is. And why do we need that de definition? Because when different um, parts of the state uh, define environmental justice differently, it creates loopholes 
for those communities that always get the short of the end of the stick to once again um, not receive the protection, support, and justice that they deserve. Um, and that effort is being led by uh, Chelsea Green Roots, which again is based right in Chelsea. Um, they are fighting right now in the middle of a battle around um, a uh, power substation that would be put in East Boston. For those of you who don't know, East Boston is, if you've ever flown into Boston, East Boston is that neighborhood. The, the land that Logan Airport is on used to be a pretty large park for residents of East Boston, and that was taken away, including people's homes, to build that airport. And so East Boston has jet fuel stored there, they have salt stored there, um, they're on the river, very vulnerable for climate change, and now they wanna put an electrical substation there, not to power East Boston, but to, empower, to power some of the more Northern neighborhoods like Swampscott and Marblehead, where Land property is more expensive and um, Eversource is not fighting to put substations in those communities. Um, instead, they're asking the predominantly immigrant, predominantly low income community of East Boston, again, to take another um, environmentally um, um, depleting facility. And this environmental justice bill doesn't fix all that, but at least it gives people a definition and a standard um, so that they have more ability to fight. What's really, if you want to see the, the, the best bill, there's a bill that came out recently in New Jersey, and one of the first bills in the country to say, if a community is deemed an environmental justice community, i.e. they have already taken on too many burdens in comparison to other parts of the state, you can't build anything new there. It is the strongest language we have seen so far. Other people say, we'll study it, maybe we shouldn't, but this is the first time. And I think, and I know, actually I've been able to talk to some of the activists there. They've been fighting for this for years, but what really brought it to the forefront of people's minds is that those same communities were the ones where people, COVID death rates were higher because people were breathing such terrible air um, that their lungs could not um, sustain them when they got COVID. And the same is true of the neighborhoods of East Boston and Chelsea. And so we in Massachusetts are fighting for that. Again, this is only a beginning step. It doesn't fix everything, but it's sad to me that we can't even get a common definition of environmental justice that will begin to offer some level of protection for those communities we have always asked to shoulder the burden. The other piece that I work on a, a lot is around solar policy. I would love to talk much more deeply about that. What I will say is this, I believe in solar and I'm excited. Um, I, when my former church, Bethel AME, before I uh, became the pastor of New Roots, when I was there, we uh, installed um, solar panels on the roof of the church, along with two other congregations and um, two other neighborhoods of, uh, in Boston. It was a really exciting project. And we would have been able to do much more. We, the plan was to actually be able for the church, because churches, many churches, humongous roofs, what are they doing other than sitting there looking, looking pretty? And so we thought we could put up all these panels and then actually be able to give people discounted electric rates because of the renewable energy. Particularly, we're excited to give it to renters because very few renters have access to solar energy. If you don't own your roof, how do you get access um, to renewable energy? And so we got really excited and um, partway through the project, we'd started raising money, all this stuff was going well. And there was a change in the law at the state house and that um, prevented us from being able to do the full project and made the project more expensive. And um, we were able to talk to our electives. In fact, we, when we kept pushing through, we were determined, we were like, we're gonna do this. So even though the project got cut in half, um, and we weren't able to do as much in terms of being able to give power to low-income families because of the way they changed the, the regulations. Um, we went ahead and moved forward and then we invited our elected officials to the groundbreaking, particularly one of them who was the, at that time the head of the uh, Black and Latino Caucus. And, and we, you know, he was there, he excited, he knew one of the churches, it was great. And we said in the middle, and this project almost didn't happen because of shifts at the state house. So we look forward to working with you, uh, Representative Holmes, to shift those things. And he got up and smiled because he said, I know I knew there was an ask in here somewhere, but it was an opportunity because what he said to us is, whenever they talk about solar, 
because of the way the subsidies have been in Massachusetts, they have overwhelmingly gone to homes with large single family homes, with lots of land around them, because those are easy to throw up solar. It's much harder when you're in communities where there are lots of triple deckers, where there's not enough room between houses. And so the solar companies were going to those other neighborhoods, using up all of the subsidies, quite frankly, for people who didn't need them. Now, I have no problem if you want to subsidize solar and houses in Chestnut Hill. But what I do have a problem is, is when Chestnut Hill gets the subsidy, but New Bedford can't. When Chestnut, uh, when, when Wellesley gets the subsidy, but Roxbury is cut out. And that's functionally what happened. And so we've been pushing um, ever since then and engaging some church members around this question of how do we make sure that if there are subsidies, they are flowing to the people who need them the most in the communities that have been consistently locked, up, locked out and who are most climate vulnerable. Um, and so that's another piece we've been working on. We had a bill called Solar Access for All. Um, we've moved into doing more regulatory reform within the Department of Public Utilities. Don't get me started on them. Um, I don't, they forget that there's a, a, a public in their name. I just call them the do because they function as the Department of Utilities, but we can talk about them some, sometime later. And then finally, um, really glad um, that Professor Pello mentioned the Green New Deal. Um, I am um, at the local level, uh, a member of the steering committee for the Massachusetts Green New Deal and serve as the co-chair for Renew New England, um, which is bringing of the six New England states together around Green New Deal-like policies. Um, the one that I'm most excited about and working on, and I'll go into some quick um, in my last minute, um, is around food justice. And um, we are putting a proposal together. We're like shopping it now and trying to figure this all out in the legislative process, um, that the state of Massachusetts create a farm core of 50 people with um, priority going to immigrants with prior farm experience. We have lots of people coming to this country who've been amazing farmers in other parts of the world, but can't use that farm skill here um, because farm labor is you know, highly um, uh, abused and underpaid. And so people don't end up being able to use that. But we want good paying prevailing wage jobs um, with an emphasis on immigrants with farm knowledge and young people who might be interested in going into agriculture. 90% um, of the food in this state comes from outside of Massachusetts. And we believe that it is a safety uh, and security issue that we increase the amount of food that's grown right here in the state um, so that we don't end up in a situation where we can't feed ourselves. Um, and so that policy would give those jobs to 50 people, spread them around the state. In order for a farm to receive it, they have to agree to sell at a farmer's market that serves people who are getting SNAP benefits. So that's basically food stamps benefits. And we are asking for an expansion of the project the program called the HIP um, Healthy Incentives Program. And it basically, if you have SNAP benefits, so if you get food stamps, if you spend $1 at the farmer's market, you get another dollar subsidized. So it basically makes all the farmer's market food 50% off for our low income folks. Any of you who've been to a farmer's market, you know, they tend to be a little bit more expensive than the grocery store. And so if we really want poor people to have access to them, we have to make sure that it's affordable. This means that we strengthen our, our farms in their production. We train more people to be uh, well-paid farm workers and we make sure that low-income folks have access to healthy food um, that will make them stronger and that comes from their local communities. So I will pause there. Those are just three of the things we're working on locally. We could talk about so much more. I look forward to engaging um, with your questions and I didn't squeeze in um, I know there was a really great question about how my theology informs this, so I will make sure we get to that. Um, but in 15 minutes, uh, I think I, I hit as much as I could. Um, and thank you and look forward to engaging in dialogue. All right. Th thank you, Reverend. Thank you, Professor Pello. Um, I've got a couple of questions to ask, and then I'm going to go on to the questions that we received from our listeners and viewers. So first, first question is for Professor Pello. Um, Professor, I know you've done some writing and some research on how in environmental injustice plays out in the prison system. Could you talk for a few minutes about what you've discovered there? Sure, thank you so much. Uh, I, and before I, I begin with that, just want to say I really, really appreciate uh, Reverend Mariama's comments uh, 
particularly, uh, well, so much of it, but uh, particularly the, the point about ecological justice, which is just so important for us to really broaden and deepen um, our, our acknowledgement of our, our right relationship that we need to be in with each other and, and the rest of our non-human relations and uh, for, for offering so many good concrete and positive examples of what folks are doing to, to mobilize for ecological and social and environmental justice. So thank you. Um, in terms of the prison work, yes, we are, we are finding that, well, let me just put it simply. When I talk to, especially to people who have served time in prisons, and I say, hey, are, are you aware of, of any environmental issues, you know, like water contamination, you know, poor air quality, food injustices? I mean, the response is often, you've obviously never been in a prison or a jail, dude. Like, are you new? Like, are you kidding? Like, show me a jail or a prison where there aren't environmental health issues. And uh, yes, I, I'm very, I'm a very privileged person. The only time I've been in prisons and jails is to, to visit uh, folks. But these issues are rampant in the United States. And as you can imagine, around the world, they are, there are prisons that are located on top of and smack dab next to federally designated toxic superfund sites. Water contamination, I can't find a prison or a jail without that, which is really scary because if you don't care about people on the inside and you only care about yourself, you know, some people in this country who apparently fit into that, that category, um, you should know that oftentimes that contaminated water that prisoners are drinking is the same contaminated water that people are drinking on the outside. And of course, in your neck of the woods there uh, in the, the, the state of Massachusetts uh, is a really good example of, of where this comes together in MCI Norfolk, where famously, of course, Malcolm X spent time. And so there's a wonderful group of folks called the Deeper Than Water Coalition who've been supporting prisoners at MCI Norfolk. And I, I, I will be brief on this because I'm sure others like uh, Reverend Mariama could speak at great length, but it's just a really good example of how the, the struggle for environmental justice is, is ubiquitous wherever we find oppression and where leaders in the environmental justice movement can be people uh, like Waylon Coleman, you know, who is serving a life sentence, you know, behind bars, juridically enslaved, and yet standing up for himself, his fellow prisoners, at great risk to his well-being. So I'm really inspired by that work. Thank you, Professor. Um, for for the Reverend, um, you did you talked to you mentioned at the end that you were you were looking forward to being able to uh, talk about uh, theological um, references and theological resources that have helped to inform your thinking about environmental racism. So yeah. I'd love you to speak for a few minutes on that topic. For sure, and I do want to give a shout out to the great organizing happening at MCI Norfolk. Folks do come out you know, folks that are on this side of the wall um, do come out to different rallies we do around environmental justice. So they are deeply engaged um, in this work. So I uh, definitely wanna thank you for highlighting that. Um, so for me, you know, I am a part of the Christian church and um, we have a really spotty history <laughs> when it comes to environmental um, issues. There are really amazing places. Um, the UCC church and the Presbyterian church were very engaged at the beginning of the environmental justice movement, did some funding and did some reports that made a really big difference. And we have um, had some folks in our movement who've been on the drill baby drill train. Um, there's been a lot of stuff around um, our, our rights to dominate the earth. Um, I did spend some time in Standing Rock and um, one of the first things that we did, it was 500 clergy and there, there were about, um, uh, I think it was eight of us who were of African descent, which was better than I, than I thought. Um, and I gave the address on, on behalf of that group. But one of the first things that we did was um, speak out against the doctrine of discovery, which said that you could um, do whatever you wanted to people, basically, if they weren't Christian. It was okay to enslave them if they weren't Christian. And um, that uh, theology and philosophy um, drove so much of the way um, things got down in this country, um, the relationships between Europeans and Africans um, and in and, and South America. So there's all of the world, right? Um, so I start from... Um, Genesis, quite frankly, saying God spent six days making the world, 
And on each day, God said it was good. Not so-so, like, or only good enough if the economy can afford it, but it was good. And we are the last thing on the sixth day. There's like a whole bunch of animals. We're just like the last animal. We get really excited about ourselves. But we, if, if we were supposed to be that big of a percentage, I think he would, God would have spent more days on us, but we were the last thing on the last day. And yes, we were good but we were called to be in relationship with every other being the way God has relationship with us. That is a relationship of deep caring. I tell God routinely, I don't know why you keep dealing with me when I have to learn the same lessons again and again. So I think that the relationship, you know, my big push in this church is in the same way that white Christians need to really look at the relationship they've had with all of the rest of us who are not white and the kinds of abuses that have happened, we also need as humans to look at our relationship with all the other people and species and and, um, beings that God created and said they were good and then ask, what right do we have to reject God's notion that these creatures are good? And so, you know, for, for, you know, and I can out Bible, you know, you can't out Bible me, right? So I can throw down um, by, scripture verse for scripture verse um, with, with uh, I've got, you know, evangelical friends and Pentecostals and Catholics. And we have, you know, all these really good conversations. But again, um, we are called to be in right relationship. And my understanding of our neighbor doesn't end with humans. It is all of the things creatures with whom we are in relationship with. Your oxygen, you just breathe it every day. You don't even think about where it comes from. Ain't no other human gave, gave you that oxygen. There are trees. There are tiny bits of phytoplankton in the ocean that are making it possible for you to breathe. God made our bodies in relationship with the water. Without it, we're dead. So that, before humans could read scriptures, They could see the reality of the natural world and the call for us to be in right relationship. Um, And so, you know, I I know it's hard and we can talk about economic realities and all sorts of other things, but this is a basic principle at the very beginning of the text so that we wouldn't forget, and we have. We have unfortunately not taken it seriously and not been in right relationship. Thank you, Reverend. Thank you for your very passionate response. We appreciate it. Um, Professor Pello, I think, I think you may have some thoughts on this as well. I know that you've written about speciesism, and I think there seems to be a relationship between that writing and what the Reverend has just, talk, has just been speaking with us about. Sure, absolutely. I, I can definitely assure you that there, there is no additional wisdom I could bring to this, that particular point uh, beyond what, what the Reverend just laid out so powerfully. Uh, but I also, I would say, I, you know, I'm also a person of faith, and and everything that the Reverend just said resonates really, really deeply with me. Uh, but with respect to speciesism, absolutely, and I think that's that's the point. Um, one of the major points the Reverend is making around uh, ecological justice that uh, if we take ecological justice seriously, then speciesism, that is the idea that any species should be viewed as superior and dominant than any others. Uh, is anathema. It is anathema, uh, certainly to my faith and uh, certainly to the, the ways in which a healthy ecosystem uh, and a healthy society would, would, would function. I often say to folks, look, um, you're, uh, you know, my students will say, oh, I took a history class on, on, on something or other. I say, really? Well, what, what history class? Well, it was American history or the history of this war, or the history of this society. I said, oh, okay. Um, to what degree was that history class also a multi-species history? And they sort of look at me funny. I go, because we've always been in multi-species societies. And so if that's the case, and this isn't, as the Reverend has pointed out, this can never just be about just us as human beings. So then if it's not just about just us, then how do we think about just this from a multi-species perspective? And I was delighted earlier this week, uh, or the weekend, when I got an email from a colleague of mine at the University of Sydney, who says they are launching a brand new PhD program with a focus on multi-species justice. And for me, that, that just that rings all the right bells and checks the boxes for me, because that's the kind of justice I feel like we always need to be, be about. 
The last thing I'll say about that is that even when we're just talking about human beings, we're never just talking about human beings. And that is one of the most powerful and scary points about racism. Um, in many ways, racism is already a non-human question because people of color are rarely viewed as full human beings in societies like this. So it's always a non-human or a subhuman question. So focusing on racism allows us to open up that opportunity to think beyond the human and to think about multi-species justice. Because if you're quote unquote, treating me like a dog, hunting me down like it's open season on black people, well, are you saying it's okay to treat dogs like that? Is it okay to treat other animals like that? Because I am, by, by the way, I am an animal and I am a primate and I'm a human being. And that freaks a lot of black folks out when I say that. But let's get real. When we start to identify in that way, as the Reverend said, uh, then the notion of my neighbor doesn't stop at humans. It doesn't stop anywhere. Donald Trump is family for me. And that hurts me to say, but he is family. And until we understand that, then we're going to deal with 300,000 plus excess deaths due to COVID-19 because the myth of white supremacy is supported by the, with the myth of white superiority, which says that I don't need to wear a mask because I'm superior, I'm immune, and you over there, folks of color wearing masks, that's fine, but really the health disparities of people of color dropping like flies, why is that a problem for a white supremacist like Donald Trump? Not a problem at all. That's the solution, nothing to see here. But the problem is, of course, is racism is idiotic. You don't understand the etiology, you don't understand epidemiology, and you don't understand that we are all one family. If I get it, as Martin Luther King once said, what affects one affects us all indirectly or, or directly. So we are tied in a garment of destiny that is mutual and inescapable. So uh, one justice, one family. We've got to keep that in mind. Thank you. We have a question now from the audience. Uh, it really relates to inter the concept of intersectionality. Um, question is, different groups such as women and black people have been oppressed in different ways. When these groups overlap, how much harder is it to combat environmental racism? Um, I actually think uh, it, it doesn't, I mean, so there, obviously if we have different oppressions, we need to spend some time in conversation, right? Because um, we, I can see very clearly what I've experienced. I may not always be able to see what you've experienced, right? And so we do have to create space to have some of those conversations. And I'm a big, I am anti-oppression Olympics where it's like, let's try to figure out who's at the top of the oppression because it's just not helpful. One of the things I will say that's pretty exciting to me is to see the growth of leadership of women of color, particularly of queer women of color um, at the forefront of the Black Lives Matter movement and many other movements because people who live with intersecting oppressions have an ability to connect with often and understand multiple different communities because they've lived um, all of those different realities. So, I mean, I think the, the bigger thing for me is like, I, I think there's a way in which the environmental movement pigeonhole, pigeonholes itself by not thinking outside of the box. And one of the examples I give that really I love is um, a good friend of mine, a pastor in um, Chicago, who is the policy director for an organization called Faith in Place. It's organizes faith communities um, around uh, environmental issues. And they worked on an energy efficiency bill in Illinois where um, they were gonna train young people to do energy efficiency audits in homes and then you know, work with contractors to upgrade people's homes. The key is that they decided that the young people should, who should be first in line for that training and support were young people aging out of the foster care system. Why? because the greatest correlation between ending up in prison, like the biggest one, is whether or not you were in the foster care system. It's even stronger than if you had a parent who was previously incarcerated. And so, and unfortunately many of the kids end up in the foster care system because they have a parent who's incarcerated, so there's that reality too. Um, and so suddenly you had, you know, energy, renewable energy, you know, energy efficiency folks, you had consumer advocates who were excited to see people get the savings of spending less on their utility bills. 
You had children, child welfare advocates who were excited about what was going on for young people in the foster care system. You had formerly incarcerated folks, many of whom had been foster care kids themselves, knowing that this could make sure that when kids aged out of the system, they had a setup that put them on a path to a life not ending up in prison. And that coalition was up at the state house advocating for this bill. And it blew the legislators' minds because they had never seen environmental and foster care parents show up in their office together advocating for something at the same time. So I think um, thinking more intersectionally, yes, there will be times where there'll be challenges and people have to work through and we have differences of experiences. And we really need strong facilitators. Like one of my main roles in most of the tables that I'm at is to facilitate and to intervene when there are challenges, to help people sit down when we are getting to a tough place and work it out. That will happen. But what also can be possible is new coalitions of people we've never seen together advocating for bills and things that don't just address climate change or don't just address prison, that don't just address um, economic justice, but bring all of those things together. And I think we are losing by being siloed in our thinking of only one piece. Because when you start saying, I want you to put you know, $50 million to something, but it's gonna have four or five positive impacts coming out of it. You've got more people advocating for it and you're making a bigger impact in that great transition and evolution that we are called to. So it is hard at times. But what it produces is better policy, stronger movements, um, and we need that. So we just got to do the work. And we do probably need to have more elders, um, more people who kind of serve the role that I do, which is when people have a hard time, how can we sit down and work this out? How do we keep the big picture of what we hope for, what we're working for in front of us? And I think somebody else mentioned in the question, and I think this is really important, um, that means not just having movements that are fighting against things. Now, there are definitely things worth fighting against, power plants and pollution, all sorts of things, but movements that are fighting for something. That's what's most exciting for me about this Green New Deal work. We are saying we cannot just face this crisis and survive. We could transform ourselves. We could lift up people that need to be lifted up. We could make people stronger post-COVID through this work. That's exciting and it's visionary. And so it makes it easier for us to work through the inevitable challenges of being humans, trying to find common ground, when what we are working towards is something we all look forward to telling our grandchildren about. And we don't wanna be cut out of that story. We don't wanna make that fall apart. And so we have more incentive to find our highest selves, to work through um, and push through when we are fighting for something that we've hoped and dreamed for. Professor Pello? Uh, my response is amen. <laughs> okay. Oh, goodness. I mean, I, I guess, you know, I would just, I would say absolutely to everything uh, the Reverend just said. And, you know, uh, I mean, it's true, yes, that different groups are impacted differently by. By environmental harm, but I would say that, uh, as, as, as the reverend said, I mean, this represents an opportunity uh, because environmental justice is an intersectional issue. I've, I always get the quote wrong, but you know, the late great Audre Lorde said something to the effect that, right, we we don't live and we can't afford to live single issue lives, right? There's so many things that people are dealing with, and uh, you know, the environmental justice movement has historically and continues to this day be led by women and by women of color. Uh, so we're already there in many ways. Now, frankly, they're underpaid, they're under-recognized and often invisible, uh, no question about that. But we see that represented in even the names of, of many organizations, groups like uh, Madres del Este de Los Angeles or Mothers of East LA uh, is a group that's been around since like the 1980s, fighting for environmental justice, fighting for public health, fighting for criminal justice reform in LA. It's another group that, that's uh, cropped up in LA recently, Padres Pioneros, 
uh, I think it's, you know, pioneering parents, it's a group of women, mothers, who are organizing recycling and waste reduction and for green space. Hazel Johnson, as I mentioned, um, you know, was my mentor and has, you know, the, the, the moniker, the black mother of the environmental movement. So um, the last thing I'll say is that I often like to go back to the principles of environmental justice, that sort of founding sort of document and guide for much of us, uh, although, you know, it could always use critiques and tweaks. Uh, from 1991, I believe it was. It's a really fantastic document, and I often say it's far more radical and transformative than the movement itself has ever been. And just to, you know, apropos of this conversation, if you read those principles of environmental justice, you will see how deeply intersectional they are. And again, seeing that diversity of that demographic spectrum of people who are being impacted by environmental harm as an opportunity, as an opportunity for unity, for growth, um, and for recognition of those differences. So we don't make the mistakes of simply saying, oh, all lives matter and let's just universally say that. No, let's actually understand how different people are, are interacting with each other and are impacted and use that as a point of strength and unity that we can build on. Everybody has something to contribute to this conversation. And so I think the environmental justice movement on the whole has done a very good job of that. Great. Let's do one more question and then we'll close um, with cl closing re remarks from each of you. So here's the final question. I think it's very appropriate for, um, for this uh, webinar coming out of Boston College uh, and an academic setting. So here's the question. It's important to pin hopes on the younger generation. Um, uh, how can the younger generation's abilities be maximized to move critically needed systemic change forward, particularly in the area of environmental racism? I'm gonna, we've got about five minutes for this question, so, but I invite both the Reverend and Professor Pello to, uh, to take a stab at it. You don't wanna go first? <laughs> I've been going first a lot, so I'll okay. be first. Okay, um, so I think I'll, I'll be brief. I'll, I'll say, you know, in many ways, you know, with the Greta Thunbergs of the world, the the youth out there. I mean, this the climate justice, environmental justice, ecological justice movement. Some of the most exciting leaders in this movement are, in fact, the youth. And so I I, I don't want to be offensive to to people who are my age and older, but in some ways, some of us need to get the heck out of the way. That could be a good way to support uh, what, what youth are doing. Um, I also think that there is a patronizing element. Oftentimes, folks my age are like, oh, it's just so wonderful that young people out there pat you on the head, good job. I think, you know, and youth have been saying, you know, take us seriously. So I'm going to take you seriously. So this is my message, one of my messages to youth. I'm taking you seriously. And by that, I mean, I'm giving praise. I'm recognizing the great and important work you do. But I'm also going to offer a criticism. And the criticism, and this does not necessarily apply to all youth and all youth movements for ecological climate and environmental food justice, but it applies to most of you. And the criticism is this, never, ever, ever be suckered into thinking that the government or states more broadly are going to be the site of resolution for our struggles. The government is often, most often, the perpetrator of the problem. So when I see youth out there calling themselves extinction rebellion, like, mm, no, I think you're an extinction protest movement. You're not a rebellion. My ancestors engaged in a rebellion. And they weren't like, hey, can we have slave free Friday? Maybe have half a Tuesday off? No, if we were gonna rebel, we were gonna overthrow the system. So if you're gonna be about rebellion, get serious. Don't rely on the government to solve your problems. And the end goal shouldn't be to get policymakers to do everything for us. We have to work with the state, but we also have to imagine and think and act beyond the state in terms of our solutions. So that's my loving embrace and critique of the youth movement. And I will lead with you and follow you. Yeah, so I um, work a lot with young people. And I think that, um, one, I do think we have to share power. Like that is a huge thing. If, if we believe in different models of power, we say that, you know, we want to shift things, we have to create those new models. And that means really dealing with issues of adultism and really figuring out how we do intergenerational organizing. I really do believe in the power of intergenerational organizing. I believe that the tension between generations is not healthy and is a partial, 
it is both real as people come into their own, but the um, stark uh, division is, I think, also somewhat of a um, product of a sort of white supremacy and a, and a lot of ways of thinking and being that are not, not healthy. Um, so I, I want to see young people and adults working together in mutually um, beneficial, um, powerful relationships with good, strong power sharing. Um, and so I think that's really important because we are at an all hands on deck moment. We really can't have seven different movements going in all these different directions. I'm a believer in self-organizing and I'm not saying everything has to be centralized, but I also feel like we have to be more coordinated than we are at this, at this point. I also wanna encourage young people to have not just a critique of what um, you want to see done, but begin to put more energy towards imagining and creating the alternative. Because I do really believe um, that oftentimes people who are not as inculcated in the system as it is have more ability to think outside of the box. I think younger people are generally going to be more courageous, in part because you haven't been beat down maybe as many times, right? And, and there's a real opportunity for innovation and we need, need, need it. Um, and I think one other thing I would say is that um, I see really exciting and powerful um, signs of deep community building, but I wanna caution against wokeness culture and its toxicity in building beautiful and powerful communities. I'm not saying we don't need to name things. I'm not saying we don't need to call um, people in, but we are all human. We are not perfect. And if we create a standard of how people have to be, that excludes like 95% of people, who's gonna join our movement, right? Like there's people in my neighborhood who say highly problematic, even like today I was running and Brett was like, hi, beautiful. And I was like, now I could do a whole critique of how I do not want you to call me beautiful, but I'm gonna start with where you are and we're gonna start from there. And as we continue this conversation, I'm gonna tell you, don't call me beautiful. But I'm not gonna say it to you the very first time because that would shut off the conversation. How do we have a movement mindset that says we all need to grow and we all need to shift, but I'm gonna share that with you from a place of love because I believe you can be better. And from a place of humility, because I recognize I may have known, I may know this today, but I didn't know it four weeks ago. And I will find something out in two months from now about how I have been behaving that needs to shift. We ain't nobody woke. We are all awakening. And just because you got up, your alarm clock went off a little bit earlier than the, than the next person does not mean that you can look back on them like they ain't nobody. And so I just want to push us around, um, again, young people have risen up. If young people had not done what they did in the last two years about climate change, we would not be where we are. Let's just name that, period, done, right? There is a way we have gotten to as a, as a world that is because of young people. And now we need to take some additional steps. And I just want us to figure out how do we put the movement, the transformation that we want first and make it possible for each of us to continue growing and transforming, even as we invite new people in to be part of that process. Nobody, when was the last time your parent was like, you're terrible, blah, 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 blah. And you were like, based on that, I want to go change. So let's approach other people with the kind of um, orientation to change and feedback that we would want to experience. Um, and I think that will help us to grow this movement even bigger and wider um, in some powerful ways. I'm so thankful um, to, to follow, to be a part of this. Um, and that's why you know, I hope that we will continue to evolve and transform in the ways needed, because um, we do got a little bit of a deadline and we're, we're in miracle territory. We're in miracle territory, like turn it around. That's why I think even scientists call me as a minister, because I think they even they recognize as, as empirical as they are, they're like, turning this around is miracle territory. And we all gotta be the absolute best we can be um, to make this happen. Thank you, wow. Wow. Well, I think we've just heard our closing statements uh, from our panelists. Thank you so much. You've given us a lot to think about. 
you've inspired us. Um, and we'll be thinking about your words for a long time to come. Uh, I, and I Laura, somebody imagine. asked how I, they could get involved. And I was just going to say, we'll, we have those sessions tomorrow for people who want to know, dig more into the details of how they can get involved. Yeah, we have a student session tomorrow. Exactly. Um, some of you have already signed up for that. Um, there'll also be, we're, we're holding a series of conversations with the BC community about environmental racism. So, so please stay tuned from, uh, to hear from the Schiller Institute and the forum on additional events on this topic. I don't know if we'll be able to come anywhere close to the, how spectacular our speakers were and our conversation was this evening. Um, but I can say that we're gonna try, we're gonna keep this conversation going on campus and beyond. And uh, I thank you very much. I think we're off. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Really wonderful. Thanks so much. Okay. Thanks. I guess we're gone. I, okay. Bye. <laughs>